in. This is a, a statement from American Express where they were denying a customer a refund and they said something like um, chip and pin cards cannot, uh, chip and pin charges cannot be disputed as the card would have, have to be in possession when the charges were put through. So basically, because chip and pin is infallible, the card must have been there, you must have typed in the right pin, therefore it's your fault. Well, it turns out the banks were wrong. We will stay with the question of money because most of us don't think twice about paying for something in a high street shop by keying in our pin. It's easy, it's fast, and in most cases it works. But scratch a little under the surface and there are persistent reports of people who say they've been the subject of fraud of one kind or another on their credit card or their debit card. Now a team of computer scientists at Cambridge University has found a flaw in chip and pin so serious they think it shows that the whole system needs a rewrite. Our science editor Susan Watts has the story. But we have to question the, the entire uh, architecture uh, that surrounds chip and pin. It really is time for um, a closer look to be taken in this whole area. But this flaw is really a whopper. Well, we think this is one of the biggest flaws um, that we've ever uncovered, that has ever been uncovered against payment systems. And, you know, I've been in this business 25 years. This is um, a flaw on a system that's used by hundreds of millions of people, by tens of thousands of banks, by millions of merchants. So how does the attack work? Essentially what it does is exploit a flaw in the chip and pin system that allows the terminal to think that a correct pin was entered and the card to think that a signature authorized the transaction. So at the end, the receipt says verified by pin. The bank is going to think that the pin was entered correctly, but uh, the criminal actually did not know the pin. Cambridge University gave us permission to see if the attack works in real life. The team set up in one of the university's cafeterias. We obviously don't want to give out too much detail, but in simple terms, SAR is hooking up the stolen card to a chip. This is controlled from a laptop and runs software written by the team. All of this is hooked up to a fake card which slots into the actual shop terminal. The kit wouldn't have to be this big. The team's already working on miniaturizing it into a unit the size of a remote control. Saar has a trick up his sleeve. His dummy card has a concealed cable running up his arm to the kit in his backpack. So will it work? He doesn't need to know the actual pin from the stolen card any combination should do. The stolen card is getting a message that the purchase has been authorized by signature. Hello. This mismatch should allow the transaction to go ahead. And yes, it does. The printout states it's been verified by PIN. In fact, Saar tried a handful of high street debit and credit cards keying in 0000, 000 as the PIN, and it worked every time. So is this attack happening in the real world? The Consumers Association thinks chip and pin has helped to bring down instances of card crime, but many cases remain unexplained. It's very difficult to quantify exactly how big this problem is. What we do know from our um, investigations is that, say, around 14% of, of, of consumers on a representative basis will have said that they have suffered some kind of um, financial loss, which they believe is through fraud. The percentage of that which is actually from th uh, this type of potential problem with chip and pin is something that's a lot less clear. What we do know is that we do have cases that are brought forward from individuals which seem quite persuasive. We understand that behind the scenes, some of the banks are already working on fixing this flaw. But they obviously haven't all fixed it yet, because the banks didn't alert any of us to the purchases we made using the Cambridge attack, our cards, and a PIN 0000. So let's see what's actually going on there when we carried out that attack. The EMV protocol is complicated. 
it's ridiculously complicated. It's 4,000 pages long from the specifications that are publicly available, and there's more secret specifications which go into more detail. So this is radically simplified, and also here I'm talking about how it's used in the UK and a few other countries. Um, this isn't necessarily universal. The first stage is called card authentication. Here, the card presents to the terminal a digitally signed certificate, an RSA signed certificate that gives its card number, um, the cardholder name, and a few other bits and pieces. Then the customer is asked to enter in the PIN, and then the terminal sends to the card the PIN exactly as it's been entered by the customer. The card checks whether it's correct and then sends a, a yes or no answer back. Now, that answer isn't authenticated. It's simply yes or no. Then there's transaction authorization. And this is really the, the core of the protocol. So the terminal sends to the card a description of the transaction, so the amount, the currency, what type it is, the dates, and a few other little things. And then the card calculates a MAC over it, a message authentication code, normally triple DES, and then sends that to the terminal. Now the terminal has a choice whether it should go online or not, whether it should contact the bank which issued the card. In the UK and most other countries, in almost every case, sometimes in every case, it will contact the bank. And in this talk, I'm only talking about online transactions, where the MAC and the transaction is sent to the bank which issued the card. The bank checks this according to the records that make sure the keys are correct and the contents are what they expect. They also make sure you have enough money in your account and then send an answer back to the terminal to say whether this should go ahead. And that's, that is authenticated. But clearly the, that isn't working. So what went wrong? Well, if we look at the system in a bit more detail and look at what is actually sent to the card, well, there's the amount, there's the currency, there's the date, there's um, a nonce, it's a random number, um, and then there's a TVR. And the TVR is the thing that contains the terminal's view of how this transaction went, whether anything went wrong, and if something went wrong, what was it? And byte three within here deals with the PIN. And it answers questions like, did the PIN verification fail? And was the PIN required and not entered? Now, if we look at the bit of the spec which actually talks about it, although this is really the core of the protocol, it's only in the Annex C5 in a little table at the back. And there's not very much detail. This is all there is that's available. And the two fields that I'm interested in are there's um, bit 5, which is pin entry required and pin pad present or not working. Now, what does this actually mean? What does it mean? that pen entry is required. I couldn't find anywhere else in the spec where it clearly said, what does it mean? Does it mean the card requires it? Does it mean the terminal requires it? Does it mean the terminal can do it and thinks it should? So there's a little bit of um, vague details in there. And the case is very similar for bit four. So I probably spent about a day trying to work out what this meant because I was trying to implement a compatible version. But the people who are working for term terminal manufacturers don't have that luxury of time. They can't spend a day deciding whether to set a bit or not. So I thought it was reasonable that if I spent that amount of time doing it, then maybe some terminal manufacturers would get it wrong. And maybe in that case, the banks would not be able to use this TVR to detect whether the PIN was entered, in, in, entered correctly. So I think one reasonable explanation for it is um, if the PIN is not required, then make the TVR all zeros. Because it's not required, you don't need to set the bit. But on the other hand, if the PIN is entered, incorrect, entered correctly, then the TVR is still zero because it was required, but it was set correctly. So these two cases where one, the PIN is not required, and two, the PIN is correct, look the same from the bank's perspective. So that means that a man in the middle can change the result to the PIN verification, and the bank won't be able to tell what's going on. And that's exactly what we did. And what this allows criminals to do is to steal a card that they don't know the PIN, but still make the bank think that the PIN was entered correctly. So how do we actually do this? Well, firstly, we build a bit of hardware for doing the man-in-the-middle attack. 
and we used an, an FPGA board for doing the low-level um, electrical interface, and then we used a PC running some Python scripts for doing the software side of things, and we put this all in the backpack which you saw. But in fact, it's very, very simple. All it's doing is having a malicious card shown in red, which is able to talk to the real card. The first stage of the transaction is card authentication. So here, we relay the messages between the real card and the terminal without modifying them. So the additional signatures still work out fine. The criminal then enters in 0000, or anything. It doesn't really matter what he types in. The terminal will then send that 000 to the man in the middle device, and then it sends back to the terminal the answer yes. It will always answer yes. And we never send that pin to the card. We never ask it anything to do with pins. And then transaction authorization continues just as normal. We don't modify any messages coming in. We don't mes modify messages coming out. So that means that the message authentication codes will still be valid. Therefore, when the Mac is sent to the bank for verification, they will come back and they will say yes. They can't tell what's been going on. So to see why they can't spot what's going on, let's have a look again at the actual definition of the transaction. So you've got all the usual things, and here's the TVR. Well, the TVR has got a, a bit that says, did the pin verification fail? Well, the card doesn't think pin verification failed. It just wasn't attempted. And that will happen legitimately. Some terminals don't have pin pads. Some terminals have a pin pad that's broken, and the EMV system was designed to allow it still to continue in those cases. Also, some customers, yeah, also some customers cannot enter in a pin. You can get cards which have a flag that, say it, that, that says, I don't accept pins because maybe this person is disabled and isn't able to properly use a pin pad. So these cards exist. From the terminal's perspective, of course it didn't fail because it got the answer back from what it thinks is a real card, which says that the verification succeeded. Then there's a question, um, was, pin verification, was the pin required and not entered? Well, here, it wasn't, the card doesn't think it's required because of all these cases where it's not, and the terminal doesn't think it's required and not entered because it was entered. So, in all those cases, it's perfectly happy. So we, we told the banks about this. We, we practiced responsible disclosure. We told them about it in November 2009 and offered to help them try to fix the problem, understand the problem, and we heard nothing. Nothing happened whatsoever. Then three months later, um, we spoke to some journalists, it went on the news, and then things started happening. <laughs> yeah. the, bank, 